Hi, I'm Dr. Libby Crockett. I am a board certified obstetrician gynecologist here at Grand Island at the Grand Island Clinic. Um, I also have a master's degree in public health um, and have a special interest in um, that area. I am getting a lot of um, great questions and having a lot of really interesting discussions with my patients right now about the COVID-19 vaccination. One of the big things that well, I'm really discussing with my patients is a lot of them just really want some good, accurate information. They're finding it really confusing when they're trying to seek information for themselves, either online or from friends. Uh, and they're finding that there's a lot of uh, very conflicting and confusing things out there. Um, so I really wanted to kind of take that conversation that I'm having with patients to you. One of the big questions that people bring to me is that um, they're concerned that this new kind of mRNA vaccine technology is just so new that we don't know anything about it. So first of all, it's actually really cool technology. Um, if you ever look at a cell, there is a nucleus and then there's um, it's inside the cell and then there's like kind of a bigger area that has just cytoplasm around it. And the DNA, that's kind of just like our um, blueprint structures that we get from both of our parents that determine all of our um, kind of physical traits um, is kind of trapped in that central nucleus. But all of that information has to come out somehow into the cytoplasm of the cell where all the machinery that makes proteins that basically, you know, make up our bodies is made. Um, and so the way that the thing or the way that is done is with a very delicate and fragile a structure called messenger RNA um, or mRNA. And so it's able to just make a really uh, short um, term structure that copies that information and takes it from the nucleus into the cytoplasm of the cell. And then once it's used, it gets degraded. It's such a delicate, fragile uh, thing. It doesn't stick around in our bodies for very long and it gets used up really rapidly. So I kind of compare it to, you know, those carbon copy receipts, you know, those yellow ones. So, you know, you'll get it and then three days later you look at it and you don't, you can't even read it anymore. mRNA is a lot like that. It's not meant to be used for a long term or stick around for a really long time at all. The other piece of that is mRNA technology is actually not really new. Um, the idea for using mRNA in a vaccine was uh, really came about in the 1990s with a Hungarian scientist. And then in 2003, when that first SARS-CoV uh, virus went through, we knew we were really susceptible to a global pandemic. And that's when a lot of that, um, the idea of using mRNA technology in vaccines to be able to be produced rapidly for a global pandemic really started happening. Um, just to kind of give an ex example that um, mRNA research um, and vaccines has been around for so long is the company Moderna. Um, it actually stands for Mode RNA, and that was founded in 2010. So that was 10 years of just mRNA vaccine research. That's all that company really does for 10 years before the pandemic even happened. On this slide, you can see that there, um, you know, there's kind of this oval, and that's when we talk about research uh, studies, because a lot of people are nervous that there's only, you know, there's not enough research about these vaccines. But, um, you know, before it ever comes to humans, there's tons of research that happens. And so, you know, this, this oval represents probably about close to 30 years of research that happened on uh, with mRNA to get it to this point in time, including animal studies. Um, and there were even um, vaccines, mRNA vaccines trialed in humans prior to the pandemic for cancer targeted therapies. Um, once um, a clinical trial happens, um, that has three main phases. So the first phase is looking at a uh, major side effect profile. And every major side effect profile from a vaccine in history has happened in the first eight weeks. So those studies don't need a lot of time to happen. The second phase of that clinical trial is um, to test dosage. And the third phase, which is usually the biggest phase and um, the, um, with the most people and often takes the longest, tests the efficacy or whether or not the medication or the vaccination in this case actually works. The two time limiting factors in that phase three clinical trial portion of any major research study uh, for a new um, 
specifically vaccine, is that it takes a lot of time to recruit uh, people to be a part of the study. And then you have to study them in a time and a geographical place where there's a lot of that infectious particle present to be able to tell, does, it even, does this vaccine even work? So last spring, when these clinical trials were getting underway, um, a lot of the major places that do clinical research, you know, they're always studying different things. So they're studying, you know, cancer medications and blood pressure medications and other vaccines. They stopped doing a lot of that and they focused on COVID vaccines, right? Because we all wanted the pandemic to stop as soon as possible. Also, people that have never thought or ever considered being part of a clinical trial before were suddenly really interested in trying to figure out how they could, how they could, themselves could participate and actually get a, you know, a chance of getting a COVID vaccination. So um, the, um, between, you know, the Moderna trial recruited over 30,000 people for this phase of the study and Pfizer recruited over 40,000. So nearly 70,000 people were able to be recruited into these studies in just a few short months. Normally it can take, you know, on a good year, you might be able to recruit 3,000 people. And if it's, you know, just for an example, an influenza vaccine study, you would only be able to study them between November and February of every year. So you'd have to repeat this process, you know, for five to 10 years to be able to have enough people and to have enough exposure time to be able to analyze your study. So that's just one clinical study that looks at um, the COVID vaccines. And in fact, um, there's been so many more research studies done in the last year on COVID vaccinations. Um, there's just so much data coming out every day. Publications of every major journal come out and there's lots of public, peer-reviewed research that's getting published all the time in these studies. In fact, um, I looked last week and I just checked PubMed, which is sort of the, um, not sort of, it is the database that um, all peer-reviewed medical literature goes through. And I typed in COVID-19 vaccines and over 10,000 uh, different hits came up. And I didn't change my filter settings. And then I, I resubmitted a search for MMR vaccine, which is a really common childhood vaccine that's been around for decades. And only 4,000, a little over 4,000 uh, hits came up for that. So nearly twice the number, more than twice um, the number of studies are present for COVID-19 vaccines than for MMR vaccines. So you know, these are really some of the most studied vaccines in history at this point in time. So when you're talking about, um, you know, research happening really fast for that, you know, big randomized clinical trial, um, you know, a shortened timeline doesn't necessarily mean a compromise in quality. I, I give the example that if I were gonna paint my house and I, we're gonna do it, I was gonna do it by myself, it would take me at least a month to get it done. But if I had my whole neighborhood come over and help me, we could get it done in a day, and the quality would, of the finished product would actually probably be better than if I were doing it by myself at the end of the month because I'm gonna be tired of doing it and there's more time to make errors in the process. One of the other things that my patients ask me a lot about is if the COVID-19 vaccines can cause infertility or affect their babies. Um, and I also take care of, I do a lot of breastfeeding medicine in my clinic, and so people are also worried about breastfeeding. Um, the theory got kind of thrown out there that there's this protein called Zincidin-1 in human placentation. And the theory was that this protein in the placenta of humans shares a very short um, genetic sequence um, that's similar to a short sequence in the spike protein in the uh, uh, SARS-2 or the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus particle. Um, and the thought was that if you got vaccinated and you started making antibodies against the spike protein, um, then you, it's possible that your body would also have these antibodies that could cross-react uh, with the Syncytin-1. Um, and that would cause problems with pregnancies in the future. Um, so that is not being found. That, that theory really wasn't um, bought into very much by any you know, physicians or you know, scientists, but we actually have research now to show that um, it doesn't appear to be any, any issue. So one of the uh, newer studies that came out was um, an REI physician did a research protocol where they looked at people that had, you know, their vaccinated, not vaccinated, or had a history of um, antibodies from natural infection of COVID in women undergoing IVF or in vitro fertilization. And embryo implantation rates were not different among those three groups. 
um, which shows that it doesn't matter whether you've been vaccinated, had COVID or have had neither, um, you still have the same rates of pregnancy um, moving forward in them. There have been over 140,000 pregnant women have gotten the COVID-19 vaccine and are being uh, followed with the CDC V-Tracker system app. Um, and when we look at those women, we are not seeing increased um, rates of um, complications that we would others otherwise see at a baseline population. So it does not appear that COVID vaccine causes any increased risk of any complication in pregnancy. However, we are seeing a lot of increased risk of complications of pregnancies in women who get COVID while they're pregnant. So another study looked at placentas after, they, after women had delivered and there was no evidence of problems or changes or abnormalities in placentas in women who were vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine during pregnancy. However, there were significant changes um, and problems in placentas of women who actually had COVID infection during pregnancy. Um, which increases the risk of complications for both the baby and for mom. So one of the big things that is really um, hitting home right now as a physician um, over the last month is really seeing hospital, hospital, excuse me, hospitals publishing their data of their um, of vaccination status of people currently hospitalized for COVID-19 um, in their systems. And you can find these for so many hospitals for all over the country, um, including um, Brian and uh, Lincoln um, publishes one as well. You can go to their site, they're updating it daily, but you can find them for um, hospitals like Sarasota in um, Florida and Oshner and Baton or in uh, Louisiana, um, but all over the country you can find these. And they, they publish um, these charts that show the number of people um, that are hospitalized with like a little figure and they color code them differently if, if they're vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Um, and of course there are breakthroughs of people who have been vaccinated and get COVID. It's much less likely and um, it looks like people that are vaccinated are um, shed that virus for a short amount of time than people who are not vaccinated. But one of the major things is their risk of hospitalization is so much lower than in people that are unvaccinated. Um, it's, you know, when you, especially when you're looking at ICU admit data um, and then people who are intubated, it's almost all exclusively people that are not vaccinated at this point in time. So, you know, when we're really looking at um, people getting very, very ill or dying at this moment in time, it's almost um, entirely people who are unvaccinated. Um, that's really hard as a physician and a public health physician to see people dying from something that looks like it could probably be preventable at this point in time. Uh, the University of Alabama is um, really coming forward with how many pregnant women that they have in their ICUs. Um, last week they were um, on two different days they had initially published that they had seven women on ventilators and later that day or later that week they showed that they had had 10 women um, on ventilators, which is really unusual. Um, a large academic center like uh, that would probably expect to see maybe one, maybe two women with a pregnancy associated illness. Um, usually it's gonna be related to a, del a complicated delivery where they would a woman would ultimately need to end up in the ICU, maybe even like a trauma, like a car accident or something. Um, but never seven to 10 women at once in an ICU. Um, that's just really startling um, and is concerning um, that perhaps now with the Delta variant, that even the data that we had that I talked about earlier where pregnant you know, women delivering were 15 times more likely to die if they had COVID, it's starting to be concerning that, that those rates might actually be higher now with Delta um, than with the prior variants that we were seeing when that study was done. Um, I also hear a lot of people worried about the side effects, especially with regards to taking time off from work or um, given where we are with our rates going up so fast right now, I think the time to get vaccinated is now. Um, and, you know, honestly, sometimes people don't feel great after the vaccine. It's really common to have some redness or swelling right at the site where you get your vaccine to feel kind of tired, fatigued. I know, especially after my second one, I just would much rather have been on my couch watching TV that day. I did go to work, but... Um, 
those are really common and I people are really worried I hear a lot of people say well I heard so and so you know talking about people dying from getting the vaccine but um, you know when we're po when doctors are posting or hospitals are posting their you know hospitalization data there's not really people getting hospitalized for reactions for um, the COVID-19 vaccine but we have over 25,000 people right now in ICU care just for COVID um, and in the last year and a half, we've had over 600,000 people in the United States die from COVID. So, you know, um, we the there are very um, sophisticated vaccine risk tracking systems that are happening. People are studying that data and people are supposed to report whenever anything adverse happens so that we can go back through and really look at those cases and know for sure and be able to give the public accurate information. But right now with what we have, it's very clear that these vaccines um, are safe um, and that getting COVID and the illness of COVID can have a really high risk of being hospitalized, long-term health problems for people that get sick, and then even death. So I have a lot of people ask me why I got vaccinated. And so there's actually lots of reasons. I'm not gonna be able to cover all of them, but um, one of the biggest is that I had a baby last July. And um, in the middle of, you know, we didn't have vaccines, we didn't know where, what was happening. And um, it was really hard not to be able to share that, you know, big life moment with um, a lot of close family because, you know, we were nervous about keeping everybody safe. But being vaccinated and having my family vaccinated was really helpful to be able to have, you know, more support and share those, you know, happy and exciting moments with my family. Um, and also, um, I, you know, research is actually showing this too, now to back that up, but we know that women that get vaccinated um, put antibodies into their milk. And so we are seeing that happen. We see um, women that are breastfeeding their babies, like myself, um, who get vaccinated are able to um, put some of those antibodies that they're making into their milk that probably provides some protection to their infants as well uh, when their infants are too young themselves to be vaccinated. So I realize that this is a really hard decision for people that are still deliberating about, about getting vaccinated. Um, and I don't want to um, minimize, minimize that for people because it is a big deal and there's so much out there to sort through and makes it really hard to make a decision about what to do. And I just really encourage you to have that conversation um, with a trusted resource um, or with your physician because um, they will be an accurate source of information for you. I also have a lot of hope at this point in time. You know, it is showing, you know, what we are seeing is that, you know, people that are getting severely ill or dying pretty much only are unvaccinated. And so that shows that this can be a preventable illness and that moving forward, we will be able to have use technology and research to be able to make strides to get through this pandemic and move on with our lives in the future. I'm very hopeful for that. Um, and optimistic that that will happen in the coming months.